Some months ago, we came out here and we had you fill out a very long uh, survey called the Economic Development Self-Assessment Tool. And after we filled that out and uh, made some revisions with your help, as you may recall, it goes back to a uh, secure server at Northeastern University in Boston where uh, the results from Westford are compared with the results from all other communities that have taken EDSAT. That's now about 110 communities, 78 of them in Massachusetts. This is a big group. And we prepared a report. And uh, today what I'm going to do is tell you the results of that, re that report. Um, what I'm going to start out, though, is give you kind of a little background on what the economy looks like because we have members of our staff at Northeastern who are working on projecting uh, the future of the economy. So let's first of all look at the Massachusetts economy. Um, this is the growth in real output uh, in Massachusetts compared with the United States. And the blue bars are the annualized growth in what we call gross state product or real output for Massachusetts. And the red bars are the same in this case, gross domestic product, annualized growth uh, for the United States. And if you notice, in almost every quarter going back to 2012, Massachusetts has outshone the country. Uh, and particularly, you'll see, for example, uh, in 2014, for the last three quarters, plus the first two, first three quarters of this year, so in other words, the last year and a half, Massachusetts has been outperforming the United States as a whole, and quite significantly as so. Um, the second quarter was amazing. We came in with a 7.5% growth in GDP, or GSP. Part of that was the result that we were rebounding from the winter. Remember winter last year? Um, and now we expect the third quarter is going to be a little slower. Uh, we've seen a much slow growth in the uh, third quarter. That was uh, you know, through September. Uh, but we project that we're going to have another rebound through the Christmas buying season and so forth. That's really good news. Massachusetts as a whole is doing very well. And if we take a look at employment, this is the employment going back to January of three. You see the nice steady growth between, um, you know, here about 2003 as we came out of the recession, the early mild recession. We peaked here in April of 2008. Then we hit the big great recession and you can see what the great recession did to employment. And that's quite staggering. But since the end of 2009, we have seen steady growth. And in fact, it's even picked up to the point where that um, uh, we have exceeded significantly the employment in the previous peak. And as of August 2015, a few months ago, we were finally at more than 3.5 million jobs in the Commonwealth. That's very good. Our unemployment rate um, nationwide hit 5% yesterday. When it comes out for the state, we're going to be about 4.6. That's a very healthy unemployment rate. Okay. The other thing is, is that Alan Clayton Matthews, who is on our staff at the Dukakis Center, he was on the uh, former Governor's Council of Economic Advisors, Deval Patrick's Council of Economic Advisors. He's the chief econometrician for the New England Economic Partnership. And what he has done is projected out employment growth through the end of 2018. So about three years from now. And the first thing to notice is that every industry he expects will have more employment than in the first quarter of 2014. The fastest growing will be professional and business services. That will be up by about 14% over 2012, uh, 2014. The second is construction, although that will slow down a little bit after the mammoth construction boom we've been having uh, particularly around Boston, cranes everywhere. Then we have the leisure and hospitality industry, for instance, this hotel. And then we have a whole bunch of financial activities. But notice, even manufacturing is scheduled to grow. Not a lot, but that's after you know, years in which we saw manufacturing decline from 800,000 to 250,000. Very solid picture of growth. Okay. So let's take a look at Westford. We get data on every town and city through uh, the Department of Labor here, Department of Labor and Workforce Development. And these data come from the so-called ES-202 forms. Those of you who own businesses, you know this is the form you fill out every quarter, uh, giving your uh, 
your payroll, your, your number of employees, when you file your unemployment insurance taxes. And we have these data for every quarter, for every town and city. It's the only data that we have that gets down to the town level. So we use those, and here are the number of establishments in the town of Westford from 2001 through 2015 first quarter. That's the last data we had, January, February, March of this year. And you'll notice, back in 01, we had about 609 establishments. These are individual businesses. Um, right after the 2001-2002 recession, you were up to about 661. And you've been about steady at that number, if you think. Went down, of course, during the recession. Came back. So that by 2013, you were back to where you were in 2003 in terms of the number of establishments, right? And then you've done very well adding about um, 35 more establishments over the last couple of years. We can also look at that in terms of employment. And you'll see here back in 2001, you had a peak employment of 11,331, dropped significantly during the recession of early 2000s, came back strong, dropped again during the recession, and then came back to a level almost as high as in 2001, although the first quarter of 2015 showed a drop. I don't know if I can really explain that. It may have been seasonal, because that was the winter, right? And then um, we can also look at uh, the number of establishments, 151 individual establishments in professional technical services. That would be, for instance, your law office would be one of them. Construction had 77 firms. Healthcare and social assistance, 71. Retail, 63 retail establishments. Wholesale and so forth. And then we can look at employment. And where was the employment? Westford is a manufacturing center. Even though it has a small number of manufacturers, as of the first quarter of this year, you had over 2,250 employees in manufacturing. And the second was in professional technical services, then about 1,000 in accommodation and food services, including the people who work in this hotel and, and re, um, retail trade and so forth. So this gives you an idea. Most of you probably knew this already, but when you actually look at the numbers, you get a, a better idea. And again, these are the numbers that come out of the ES-202 forms. Okay. So that's the background. Let's take a look at um, what we've learned over the last 10 years of working in economic development. We began this process back in 2004 when we joined up with NIOP, used to be known as the National Association of Industrial and Office Properties here in the state, and we asked them if they would bring together some of their location and site specialists to teach us what they look at when they're helping a firm, one of their clients, select a new location uh, to set up shop or to expand their operations. And we spent, se we had several what we call focus groups. Focus groups would usually have about eight or 10, sometimes 12 of these folks around. And we just asked them open-ended, when you are looking at a community and you have a firm, let's say that's a manufacturer or it's a commercial mall or it's an office complex, what are you looking for in that community? And they gave us lots and lots of answers. Based on that, we contacted national NIOP, because there are NIOPs in every state, and a national um, organization called Cornet, which is the trade association of in-house location specialists. So for example, my son, who's now 24, teaching school in, Mass in Chicago, was indeed a superstar soccer player here, played on the Bolts, played all over the United States. And one of his teammates, father, who I got to know quite well, is the vice president for site location for the Genzyme Corporation, now Sanofi. And he was up in the air all the time, uh, you know, flying around the world trying to figure out where Genzyme would put its next testing facility or its next lab or whatever. So Cornette is made up of those folks. And we surveyed 230 of them nationwide and asked them, what are the most important factors you look at and tell us how important they are. Based on that, we were able to put together the EDSAT that you went through, which today includes 220 questions, as you'll see in 10 different areas. And that is the basis for the research that you'll see today. So what we learned from them is very interesting. 
most of this, most of you in the room know. Economic development is a collaborative process. You have to build strong, adaptive economies in this new super high-speed global economy. Number two, and this was a little of a surprise to me, that these folks say, once we know we want to go to New England, we're then looking at individual municipalities and asking which municipality do we want to stay in. We want to go to Westford, uh, do we want to go to Cambridge, do we want to go wherever. And therefore, municipalities play a critical role in the location decisions of firms. And that's where all of you come in and where EDSAT comes in. And therefore, municipal officials, many of you in the room, actually play a very, very important role in economic development, along with your business community. Moreover, since I worked very closely with the Patrick administration, and with the Secretary of Administration Finance. I was on the advisory committee. And I'm working very closely now with uh, Governor Baker. Just saw him the other day. He sends his best to you. I told him I'd be here. And with the uh, Workforce Cabinet, Jay Ash, Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, Ron Walker, the Secretary of Labor, and Jim Pizer, the Secretary of Education. Um, what we do know is there's going to be little aid in the future. If you look out over the next decade, even in this booming Massachusetts economy, most of the surplus in the budget is captured in public pensions and uh, Medicaid and things like that. So there's going to be very little additional local aid, no matter how hard we fight for it. Moreover, I think it's fair to know that um, uh, the same thing is true in the federal government. I mean, no matter who becomes president uh, uh, literally a year from today, um, there's going to be very little aid coming in the future for, from the federal government, at least relative to the past. So in other words, you guys are on your own, right? Um, you've got to figure out, and I'm not just you, Westford, I'm mean, saying all 351 Massachusetts communities have to think about how can we pull this off ourselves? And you become very important. How do you attract business enterprise? And our motto has become, uh, as we learned from our NIAP buddies, town officials working with the business community have to become the CEO for economic development. And there are many reasons why people have join town council or join town meeting or become mayor, uh, and only one of them may have to do with economic development. But we're saying that is a more and more important role for municipal officials. And to play that role, you need a little training. You need a little education, like in anything else. And what we hope EDSAT has done is provided some of that. So municipal leaders must initiate and support the development process. It starts in your office. And what EDSAT does is help you assess your strengths and weaknesses to help you do that. And then your goal is to change what you have control over and where you don't have direct control over, collaborate with others to influence change. Okay? This is our fundamental proposition, which I, we came up with years ago and I think it's still perfect. Cities and towns have the ability to create their own destiny and they can benefit from having sophisticated partners. That's Ali and me. We're sophisticated. <laughs> Who can help, don't I look it? Who can help them develop tools and information to compete successfully? And this is just a little bit more on the development. Here's the list of, uh, and the distribution of the survey respondents. They were from all over the country and they work with all kinds of industries. And um, what they talk, told us, they have their own lingo, these guys and women. And that is they keep talking about deal breakers. We go into a town or a bunch of towns and the very first thing we're looking at is why shouldn't this firm come here? Not why should they, why shouldn't they come here? Is it a problem that you don't have public sewers? Is it a problem that uh, the last few firms that came here spent three and a half years getting through the zoning process? Uh, is it that you don't have a trained labor force? So they first of all look for reasons not to like you. But then what came out of this is you have some deal breakers. Every town does. Every community does. Even Cambridge, because the high cost of land is keeping firms from moving in now. You do a, a self-assessment of your strengths and weaknesses. You take some action where you can. And your goal is to turn those deal breakers into deal makers. Right? So, yes. And what are some of those deal breakers? Well, one that we've heard over and over again, and we heard that 
in our focus groups, and we heard it in when people had a chance on their survey to fill in open-ended questions, they kept talking about this phrase, time to market, which I think NIAP may have patented that phrase. But if you think about it, companies now have to move more swiftly than ever. I mean, the best example I have, of course, is um, my cell phone. Right? I have a, what is this? This is an iPhone uh, 5, so incredibly obsolete. Um, right? Um, and yet Samsung comes out with a new one, and Nokia comes out, and then iP iPhone comes out. And those are coming out every few months because you make your money today when you have a breakthrough before other people have a product that competes with you. So anything that slows you down puts you in trouble. Okay? How many of you here have an iPhone of any kind? How many have an iPhone 6? Okay, how many of you have a Samsung? Okay, how many of you have a Blackberry? <laughs> What's a Blackberry? Blackberry dominated the market. They had 100% of the market. But they were very slow to come to the touch screens and things like that. And the only people of Blackberries left are members of the federal government and the military. Right? That is true of all industries we learned. You got to be quick, you've got to be nimble, because we're not just competing with the folks down the block, we're competing with people around the world. The second, and Westford doesn't have to worry about this, but Lowell does, and Lawrence and others, is many people have cognitive maps. Everybody has a cognitive map or an impression in their head, they use the term cognitive map, about a particular community, including those site developers and site specialists. So all I have to do uh, is say, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. That's where I grew up. I grew up in the 50s and 60s. Detroit was the single richest city in the world. Detroit had the highest median family income of any city anywhere in the world. Today, not so good. How many of you have been to Detroit in the last three years? Okay, very good. Of those who have not been to Detroit in the last three years, tell me whether you have a cognitive map or impression of what that city is like, right? And it's not very pretty. What were you doing in Detroit? I grew up there. Where? Southfield. Really? That's where my parents lived. Yeah. I went to Mumford High School. Oh, okay. Did you go to Southfield High? Southfield Bayfront, which is closing. Yeah, my parents were at 10 Mile and Telegraph. Yeah, 4 Mile. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about Detroit today. Coming back, making some progress? I used to drive down Woodward Avenue all the time to go into the city of the grid town, and I would never do that today. Yeah, okay. Except there is some movement now, and some new housing and some new businesses going in. But still, that cognitive map is pretty strong, right? Business. Business. You have business in Detroit? I have business in Detroit, but I was there for a conference. I see. At Cobo Hall? There you go, right downtown, next to Tiger Stadium, next to Ford Field, and next to some of the biggest casinos in the world, which is their major industry now. Did you win or lose? I, I didn't get to the casinos. Oh, you didn't get to the casinos, too bad. Okay, otherwise you'd be, you know, in the Caribbean on a yacht right now, right, having won all your money. So, changing co cognitive maps. You know, until quite recently you'd think Chelsea. If you knew anything about Chelsea, you'd say this is a basket case. Mm, anything but that. Lawrence coming back in many wonderful ways. Lowell. So changing those cognitive maps are pretty one. Too little attention to site deficiencies. Jay Ash is a dear friend of mine, and Jay was city manager of Chelsea and did a phenomenal job. Uh, but he tells this wonderful story of bringing Bob Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, uh, owners of the Revolution, to Chelsea when he was trying to see if he would be willing to build a big soccer stadium in Chelsea. And Kraft met with him, and he shows them this beautiful area where they could have the stadium and parking, and how they would give them a lot of incentives to come and build that stadium. And then um, Bob just turns to Jay and says, well, uh, the city manager, Jay, tell me, um, how many parcels are in this piece? He says, 31. How many owners are there? 31. And Bob says, when you get them all to agree, come back and see me. Site deficiency, right? Um, slow municipal processes, which are tied 
to this time to market, if it takes a long time to get through zoning appeals, are you on that board? <laughs> or building inspections, that today is a problem, a big problem as it turns out. And what was really fascinating to me was these location specialists, almost every one of them out of 230, and every one of them in the focus group said, you know what the problem with most towns, not Westford, is they think that we'll be attracted by tax breaks. In fact, it turns out it's just the opposite. If you're a town or city and you sit down with a potential firm, and the first thing you do is offer them a tax break, let's say a 50% property tax abatement, they're out of town in the next five minutes because they realize that if you're starting out with a tax abatement, there's gotta be some real bad things going on in town. It's a signal that you've gotten down to the point where you're trying to give away tax breaks to attract somebody. In fact, we're gonna find a fascinating result in just a few seconds, okay? So we did, um, when we did the first Cornette survey, we looked at permitting processes, labor, development and operating costs, business environment, transportation and access, the quality of life and social environment. And based on that, we created this EDSAT tool, which has 10 different sections to it, which some of you were here went through it. Access to customers and markets, highway access, access to airports, the concentration of business and services in a particular sector, think Cambridge Life Sciences, uh, the cost of land, labor, both uh, the quality of labor and the cost of labor, municipal process. You're gonna have this whole thing after this is done. Or are you taking pictures of me? You like me that much? <laughs> Tell my wife, would you? Okay, you can, you can take all the pictures you want. Just, okay, it's, this is my good side. Okay, great. Okay? Um, the quality of life of the community. That turns out to be very, very important, particularly if the firm is going to have their executives living in that community. Quality of life right where the site is. Do you have restaurants where you can go to lunch? Do you have daycare facilities and things like that? Business incentives, we wanted to find out about that, and tax rates, okay? And finally, access to information. I'm a site developer. I'm working for these three firms. How do I get the information about this town? I'm looking at 50 towns, right? Answer is, I do exactly what you do. You Google Westford, Massachusetts, and you look at your website, right? And the website, as it now turns out to be, is very important because how you make a decision as to what will be your short list often occurs after they looked at the website. Let me give you an analogy. This past fall, Northeastern University, where Ali and I work, got almost 51,000 applications for freshman slots. We have 2,805 freshman slots. Question, how do you review 51,000 applications? Answer, I go to the vice president for uh, enrollment management, my friend Philly Mentel, and I asked her that question. She said, well, as a matter of fact, um, we hire dozens of of part-time consultants who do the first review of our applications. And they've come back many years, so they know us. And they review those, and they just have one job. They put them in a discard pile, gone forever, or for further consideration by the official staff of enrollment management. Cool. I then asked Philly, what is the average time that one of these, consult this, these temps spend on one application. Six minutes. Now, how many of you have had kids who have gone to college? How many of you helped them fill out their application, write their essay, take the SATs? <laughs> how many hours did you spend on this and how much sweat? You got six minutes to impress that person. What do they look at, I asked Philly. They look at your SAT score, they look at your GPA, your grade point, they look at your class rank, and they read the first paragraph of your essay. And if you don't catch them in that short period of time, 
you're in the discard pile and you're not coming to Northeastern. Okay? Well, similarly, the website turns out to be critical in how these firms do their first cut. They want to know what this community is like because remember, they don't know anything about Westford or very little. They want to know what your economic development strategy is. They want to know what your um, approval processes are. And the better you can promote, the better. Now, I am an economist. I don't come out of the business school. I didn't watch Mad Men. I don't think about advertising and marketing. I have learned that all of these companies that spend billions, tens of billions of dollars a year on advertising aren't stupid. They advertise for a reason. It doesn't affect me, I don't think, right? I'm not drinking any more Bud just because I'm watching Bud commercials, you know, 50 of those commercials during a Pats game. But apparently it affects somebody. That's what's real important. Okay. And what happened is we developed this um, uh, routine for the EDSAT report, and you can all see the EDSAT report for Wesford. Uh, which Ali and I put together with Kathy Tumber on our staff. And what we did is we said, okay, let's look at every one of the questions and we're going to rank you relative to the competition, relative to the other communities who've done it. And because it's a big, thick report and you could get, your eyes could glaze over, we came up with a way of making it easier to flip through the report and that is for each question, we give you green, yellow, or red. Green means you're doing better than average. Yellow, your average. Red, not so good. But we also wanted to rank these questions on how important they were. So based on the survey of NIOP and Cornet members, we came up with what we call our moon system. So if a question has a full moon, that means that's really important in terms of the way they see this factor relating to the decision as to whether your community is a good community for investment. Half, you know, half moon is somewhat important and an empty moon means this is a much less important factor. I have sat down with mayors and at their side, flipped through, and all of a sudden, I'm thinking about one particular mayor on the North Shore, who all of a sudden got very excited, we're green, we're green! And I turned to the mayor and I said, but I'm sorry to tell you, no one gives a damn about that one. Now, you see here where you're red? And you see the full moon? That's real bad. You gotta fix that. And in fact, they are fixing that in Lynn, which is, oops. That's where we did that, okay? So, let's go look at the EDSAT results for Westford. We're almost done. Let's look at the results here, okay? What are Westford's strengths and what we call deal makers? You got a lot. So these are the ones that are really important, the full moons. One, you've got good highway access. Two, you've got parking. I just had a park yesterday for a one hour meeting, it cost me $32 in Boston. I think it's cheaper here. Right? Your traffic is actually not very bad. We got here very quickly. In fact, we got here 40 minutes earlier than we thought. Um, you have a very strong workforce here. Um, you, a majority of your residents, uh, 25 and over, have earned a bachelor's degree. Your website is actually attractive. We've looked at it. It's very nice. It's very good. And it provides a lot of information for firms and location specialists to consult. Right? Much nicer than some of the other websites we've seen. Congratulations. Uh, you have a lot of land, including some large parcels, which larger firms are looking for. You have a predictable permitting process with a flow chart and a development handbook. Yay! Most towns haven't done that yet. Your local tax rates um, are actually a little less for businesses, for industrial and commercial use. I think they're a little higher for residential use, uh, charged by those folks. Uh, you have commuter rail service not far away in Littleton and Lowell, and you have available sites. Obviously, you need available sites, okay? So how about things that were important location factors? Still important, but not as most important. You've got site amenities near some of your development sites, and all of, we've done this out of state. We've done this all through New England and other parts. We actually have a very active state in terms of providing all kinds of business incentives from investment tax credits to R&D credits to job training credits and so forth. We're lucky, um, although one of the things you can do, particularly for out-of-state firms that might be looking at you, is introduce them to all of those benefits and help them apply for them. Uh, that turns out to be very important. 
Um, you engage, as we see around the table here, local business purpose persons to represent your town. Uh, we're going to call that cross-marketing. You have darn good schools, right? Um, you have uh, reasonable labor costs, a little higher, uh, but uh, not a problem. Your crime rates are very low. Uh, your home ownership rate is very high, okay? But you have a few, not many, deal breakers. So what are they? We still find, relative to other communities, your timeliness of approvals, at least when you filled this out, is somewhat slower than other communities. You're more rigorous, you take more time, and that potentially is an issue you might want to work on. Uh, your rents for both Class A and Class B office space tend to be somewhat high, uh, and your manufacturing space on a per square foot is about 45% higher than the average of other communities. Uh, and we heard from you, we didn't know this, that you may have some limited sewer capacity uh, in the city which could affect firms that need you know, sewers and don't want to spend a huge amount of money having to put in their own pipes or a Title V. Okay? Um, then you were well, some weaknesses among factors that are less important. Um, you don't have a lot of venture capital, business planning, and specialized recruiting. That's not that important because these firms know they can go outside of Westford and get most of that. Um, and um, so far, uh, we think you could still have a better link between the business community and your town development people really marketing Westford. You're doing well, it's not that important, but we, you could strengthen that according to this. Well, that's all based on what those location specialists told us. What we really want to know is what really matters. So last year, I was actually on sabbatical from Northeastern University, and I was asked by the Boston Federal Reserve Bank if I would come and spend a year with them in their community development office, which I love doing. I had a beautiful office on the 10th floor of the Boston Fed overlooking everything, and I didn't have to deal with all the other Michigas uh, at Northeastern all of the other stuff at Northeast, and I could actually deal with real people rather than just deans and provosts. So what I did is I said, well, why don't I take all the data from the communities we had by then and see if I can do a statistical analysis to see if employment growth and establishment growth, both of those, establishment growth and employment growth, correlate with any of the EDSET factors. And which ones do they correlate with and which ones don't they? And it turns out that um, during this time, and the reason I was invited over, this doesn't affect Westford, the Boston Fed had created their Working Cities Program, which is to work with this, what others call gateway cities, but cities that have gone through significant deindustrialization in this area like Lowell, Lawrence, Lynn, Salem, but all over the state. And I said, okay, I'll start with those 20, and then I'll expand it to all of the Massachusetts communities we had by then, which was 50, I think, and let's see which of the factors from EDSET correlate with success in the growth in establishments and the growth of employment during the period from 2001 to 2013. Remember, I was there in 14. So we looked at employment trends, and this was absolutely fascinating. Actually, this blew my mind, and I should know better. But what I did is I took all 20 working cities that we were working with uh, at the Fed, and we continue to work with them, and the very first thing I did is I said, how much employment growth did we have statewide between 2001 and the second quarter of 2013, the last date I had when I did this? And that's right there. Statewide, we had less than 1% growth between 01. So remember the first chart or the second chart I had? We had that growth in the massive recession and then we were coming back. Well, we had just gotten back by 2013 second quarter where we had 1% greater employment statewide, less than 1%, three quarters of 1%. So we had just gotten back to where we were in 2001. But what about individual communities? This blew me away. Number, whoops, oi. Oops, let me go back. The one that had grown the fastest in terms of employment in the private sector was the city of Chelsea. 
Chelsea has burned down twice in the last century. The last time in 1973, right? It had a 10.8% growth rate in its employment between 2001, which is 16 times faster than the state. The second one was Haverhill, the third was Lawrence, the fourth was Brockton, all of which grew at least 10% faster than the state. How can that be? These are communities that, at least in my mind until quite recently, I thought were like Detroit. But they're not, and the question is why. At the other end, unfortunately, we saw here Malden that it lost 27% of its employment base. Remember, Malden is 21 minutes by Orange Line, T, from Northeastern Campus. Malden Center, T. Much of that was the loss of a major hospital, but there were losses of other establishments. Fall River didn't do very well, Fitchburg didn't do very well, Chicopee, Holyoke. From the point of view of a statistician, as opposed to a citizen who's concerned about all of this, what I have here is lots of what we call variance. There's a lot of variance to explain. Why Chelsea with a 10.8% growth rate and Malden with a 27% loss? What explains that? If all these towns and cities, oh, these are all cities, if all these cities had had pretty much the same employment growth, I'd have nothing to explain, right? There's no variance to explain. But here I have lots of variance. So the question is, what correlated with what? We have 220 questions in the survey that you answered. I reduced them to 26 measures or 26 factors. So I would take, let's say, four or five questions that were around access and make them into one measure. I'd take three or four factors around labor, make them into one factor. And these are the ones we had, highway access, parking availability, traffic congestion, uh, housing costs, available development sites, uh, predictable permitting, and so forth. And I then subjected, through statistical analysis, all 26 of these to try and explain that variance in employment growth. What did I find? Well, for these working cities, just these 20 cities, the factors that were most important is, first of all, you have to have available development sites. That certainly helps explain Lawrence and Chelsea. Lawrence has taken a lot of their old mills and converted them into places where businesses can grow. Chelsea's done that with some of their older buildings. So you have to have development sites. The second was site amenities. Those of the 20 cities, those that had the most site amenities in terms of restaurants, daycare centers, and so forth nearby, did better. These are positive correlation with employment growth. The third was economic development marketing. Marketing turned out to be, out of 26 factors, marketing was the third most important. Timeliness of approvals was fourth, available on-site parking, and the cost of parking was fifth, and school success, how well the kids were doing. Pretty cool. Begins to get you some idea of what matters. But then what I did is I said, let's put in some control variables. These were variables we didn't ask you about. I added extra data. So one was, what's your distance to Boston actually in minutes of normal commute time? Uh, you know, or in hours or in days of commute time. I don't know what the proper is used. And it turns out there's a slight positive correlation that if you're closer to Boston as opposed to Pittsfield, you do a little better. We asked, how about the, the wealth of your, your, the income of your community? It turns out, if anything, and these are all communities with high, you know, have low family incomes, there is a slight positive correlation, meaning that if you have a higher poverty rate, you actually had more businesses coming there, which is really interesting. I don't know if there's any cause of effect there, but it was interesting. And then we looked at the manufacturing base. Remember, you have a lot of manufacturing jobs here. If you did this analysis 15 years ago and you had a large manufacturing base, you were in trouble. Today, manufacturing is coming back and it actually has a slight positive correlation with growth in overall employment. Fascinating, right? And then I saw some factors that weren't correlated, at least for the working cities. One, I thought that complementary business services such as legal services or accounting services would be important. There's no correlation at all. And again, the reason is if I really need to get an accountant who's not in my town, I go next door. Low crime rate I thought was important. No correlation. 
Public transit, I thought that might be. But in these working cities, no. Highway access. Basically, all these communities have pretty good highway access. We're not in the middle of Nebraska, right? Rents, no correlation. Cultural and recreational amenities, small correlation. And then what was really interesting, the local tax rates actually had a large negative correlation. How can that possibly be? The communities with higher business taxes actually got more job growth. Well, that's basically what the Cornette and Naya people told us. But when I went out and I talked with some businesses, they said, that's easy. First of all, local, except for small firms, local real estate taxes are a small part of our business. It's not a big part of our, of our balance sheet. Or our... But it turns out that those communities that have higher tax rates tend to have more services. And we use those services. And so we found empirically this relationship that, uh, if anything, um, higher taxes are not a barrier and might even attract firms. Not the small firms, but the larger ones. I thought physical attractiveness of the city would be important. Not at all. Okay? But then I said, okay, that's working cities. They're all cities with higher than average poverty rates. They're all cities with a, higher, uh, with a lower percentage of wealthy families. Let's expand it to all 50 Massachusetts cities, which include the non-working cities that tend to be wealthier. What are the factors that matter there? It turns out that the most important one was economic development marketing. Staggered me. With a correlation of 0.37, which for this kind of sample is incredibly high. And followed by timeliness of approvals, then on-site parking, Public transit is now important. Cross-marketing turns out to be important. Cross-marketing is where the town officials or city officials work closely with the business organizations to jointly market the city. And the reason is businesses are much more likely to listen to another business person than they're going to listen to your town manager. Sorry, town manager. OK? But if you work together, that turns out to be very powerful. And then we had low traffic congestion, fast track permitting, and site availability. Those were the top ones. But note, this is stunning. The two with by far the highest correlation out of 26 variables are economic development marketing and timely suit of approvals. When I showed this to Jay Ash, who's now Secretary of Housing and Community Development, he, said, he smiled, he said, that's exactly what we did in Chelsea, right? We marketed the hell out of the city, and I made it clear that if you wanted to come to the city, we would make it easy. It was really helpful because I was the city manager. I was also the uh, head of the Economic Development Committee. And I was also head of the Zoning Committee. So he said it was very easy because I'd come and I'd talk with him in the morning as the Economic Development Director. And I said, OK, now let's talk about zoning. I'm the Zoning Director. What do you need? <laughs> Five hotels later, restaurants, new businesses coming in. Uh, it helps to have a czar. <laughs> I'm not asking you to do this, but I'm saying it works. Okay? And um, so that's what we have. So, where are you strong? Well, you are strong almost everywhere. In other words, as far as I can tell, you have totally wasted your time being with me. <laughs> you are already doing most of the things you should be doing. You can leave now if you wish. You, uh, we've never seen another town. J Jay, you've been with us for how many towns? Six. Six? Yeah. Have we ever seen something this good? No. no. Economic development marketing, you're doing beautifully. You've got basically free parking. You've got public transit nearby in Lowell and Littleton. Low traffic congestion. You're doing fast track permitting. And you have lots of sites available. Fabulous. OK. How about your weaknesses? The only one we could come up with is you could still do some better with your timeliness of approvals. That's amazing. That's amazing. OK? So what are our conclusions? Here are things to think about. You should think about your approval process, and you can think about things you might want to do. Some communities now are going to one-stop presentations. You might have six, seven boards. They each are going to make a decision, environment, zoning, et cetera. Some communities now are going to one meeting where they get all the boards together and a developer can 
give a presentation to the whole board. That speeds up the process and they feel very comfortable. Uh, another is um, you could still craft possibly a somewhat more aggressive attraction policy, particularly in terms of doing more cross-marketing, working very closely as you are here. But you have most good things. You've got a well-educated and skilled workforce. You've got state and local business incentives and attractive tax rates here and good state to work in. You've got an exceptional website, which is terrific. Uh, but you might want to think about streamlining your permitting process. And uh, there's not much you can do it, but your rents tend to be a little bit high. But all together, as I said, you don't need us. 